Okay, good morning, and to all the moms today, happy Mother's Day. So thankful for our moms, and let's give the moms a big hand today. <laughs> Hallelujah. My mom was 92. She passed away just uh, a few years ago. Uh, I think in 2019 it was, and uh, I miss her greatly. I only have one moment. Oh, kids, you can go with Miss Jana right now. I see her looking around, looking for the kids. Come on. There you go. All right, perfect. And I've only got one little memento of my mom. She loved uh, knickknacks with angels, and I have a little angel uh, on uh, in the bathroom where I get ready for work every day, and there's a angel that's sitting down and she has a little bird on her toe, her legs up in the air a little bit, and there's a little bird there. And I always see it and I say, Mom, or I say, Lord, tell Mom I love her and looking forward to seeing her again. But, uh, and so thank you, Moms. And I see my new grandbaby daughter. Hi, granddaughter. Hello, there she is. So your first Mother's Day, Lauren? Yes, all right. <laughs> All right, well, let's start off with a story, and uh, I've got two similar stories at the beginning and end, but I wanted to start off with this story. We're going to go all the way back to 1968. How many of you remember 1968? Okay, all three of you, yes, no, I mean, uh, the whole, tr <laughs> but anyway, uh, that was the year that the Olympics were in Mexico City. So we're going to go back to October 20th, 1968. As you can see, the sky is darkened. Uh, it's started to cool down in the Olympic Stadium. In fact, many of the people have left because about an hour earlier, this man here named uh, Mom Walde of Ethiopia, he came across the finish line over an hour earlier to win the marathon in 1968. He was an amazing runner of his time. And as he finished, he looked just as strong, as vigorous as when he started. Now, the strange thing was, you know, he, he crossed the finish line. A lot of people had left. That's what they were waiting for. They were waiting to see him win it. And, but other people hung out. They were waiting to see other people come in and finish their race. And so uh, what happened was, most of the, a lot of the people had cleared out the, the, I've seen pictures of the stands and they looked like they had about one third of the people in it. So a lot of them had already left. But like an hour and a half later, um, people in the stadium heard police sirens. They heard uh, whistles, police whistles going, all coming from the entrance to the stadium where the runners are coming through the arch there in the stadium. And so all the people in the stands, their attention turned. And, uh, oh, by the way, Madeline, I forgot you're a first time mama too, huh? All right, awesome, hallelujah. There's your baby there, okay. Um, so everybody's attention turns to that doorway and uh, a soul figure wearing the colors of Tanzania came limping into the stadium. His name was John Stephen Akwari. He was the last man to finish the marathon that year. He came in bl b uh, bandaged and bloodied. He'd taken a fall earlier in the race, and he just wasn't doing very well. And, you know, again, he finishes an hour, hour and a half after the guy that won it. And so all he could do was limp across the finish line, but the crowd stood. They applauded him. They thought it was great that he finished up. Well, after he finally finished the uh, race, uh, there was one man, a reporter, or somebody that asked him uh, straight up. They said, uh, what, uh, you're badly injured. Why didn't you quit? Why didn't you give up? And I love uh, Akwari's uh, response. With quiet dignity, he responded, my country did not send me 7,000 miles to start this race. My country sent me to finish. I love that. Yeah. That's awesome. Now, all that to say, last Sunday we talked about the Christian life being a marathon. You know, Paul talked about running the race that was set before us. And then in the book of Hebrew, actually that was the writer in Hebrews, uh, to run the race set before us, looking unto Jesus. Paul talked about, I, I've uh, 
fought a good fight. I finished my race. I've kept the faith. He kept going strong to the end. Now, the Christian life, like a marathon down here on earth, there's three different groups. I'm going to put some pictures up here to illustrate them, okay? Okay, group number one. Some people start, and this is true of the Christian life, Christian uh, um, discipleship, following Jesus, okay? They've gotten saved, they're believers, and they've started their Christian life off right there. At the starting line, they take off running, but they never finish, okay? Some people never finish. They don't finish earthly races like this, and they don't finish the spiritual race of following Jesus till the very end of their lives. They give up along the way. Others, they start the race, they run steadily throughout the race, and they finish what they started, sort of like Mamo Wolde earlier. He was just like clockwork, you know. He came across, he was strong, vibrant, right up to the end. He wasn't coming in, you know, like, ugh. Uh, and, you know, that sometimes that just happens to even the best, but not that day for Wolde. But uh, many people do this in the Christian race as well. Some people, though, they start, but they get knocked off course. They get knocked off course. And, listen to me carefully, even though they're believers in Jesus, even though that heaven is their home, even though they'll be with God forever and ever, you know what? Some of them get back up and they finish the race, but some of them don't. Some of them get knocked out and they stay out. And that's very unfortunate because Jesus said that the highest rewards in heaven are going to be given to his followers that believe, start that Christian race of sanctification, of holiness, of serving God, of serving others, and they keep going steadily to the very end. They don't let false teachers, they don't let, uh, they don't let troubles, they don't let suffering, they don't let anything knock them out of the race. They keep going for God. Now, again, that's not to say that the Christian life isn't got its ups and downs at all. Sometimes, you know, uh, we just need to be like the old Timex watch commercial. Take a lick it and keep on ticking. All right, you remember that commercial? You got to be able to do that. If things are going great, keep going. If things are not going great, keep going. Keep your eyes looking, run the race looking unto Jesus. Now, Last Sunday, right at the end, we also saw this. We saw, uh, daughter, daughter. <laughs> yeah, I'll take, I'll take the blame for that. That's my grandbaby. <laughs> Isn't she beautiful? <laughs> Listen to that voice. <laughs> All right, last Sunday, at the end, we talked about this. We talked about, Paul said, this is like the Galatians found themselves. Okay, you ran, past tense, you ran well, who hindered you from obeying the truth? And of course, we know the answer to that. These false teachers that were coming in and teaching that they had to live under the law, that they had to keep the Old Testament law, and they were just getting pounded. And, and Paul is astonished. He's shocked to his gills that this is the case. Okay? So God's people were in that third category. They started well, but they got knocked off course. And what do we see here today? We see that God wanted to get them to get back in the race. Okay? They were wavering. They were listening to these uh, bad teachers, and they needed to get back in the race. Now, all of us know someone who, first of all, needs to get in the race itself. Okay? Every single one of us know family, friend, co-worker, neighbor, you know, no matter where you look, we all know people who aren't in the race at all. That's because they've never been in the race because they haven't even gotten to the starting line, which is faith in our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. That's the starting line. But we also, we also know people around us that once we're in the race, and they've fallen out of the race. And there's a, a lot of different reasons for that. We could go down a long list and say, some people have been knocked out because of this, or because of that, or because of this, or that. Okay? But, here's the bottom line today. God wants to use every single one of us, every one of us, in some way, 
to either help people get into the race through faith in Jesus or to get back in the race. That's kind of the focus of Galatians here, getting Christians who have fallen out. They, they fell out because they were listening to bad doctrine. And listen, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's so important that we encourage one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching because it's, it's easy for people. Uh, you know, all we like sheep have gone astray. You know, I mean, it's so easy for sheep to stray. or human. And so we need each other. And that's what I'd like to speak to us on a few minutes, for a few minutes this morning. And it's this topic, helping others get back in the race. See that guy up there? There's somebody that's hurting and he's got a friend to help him to the finish line. And that's the kind of Christians we need to be. But let's start off with prayer and then we'll get right into this text. Father, use this in all of our lives today. Lord, especially bless the moms here today, Lord, that I have been so faithful, Lord. They've uh, blessed, they've encouraged, they've helped. Lord, they've spent their lives serving others, Lord, their family, their children, grandchildren, their spouse. Lord, please, Lord, put your blessing and hand on them in a special way today. And then as we listen to your word, all of us, Lord, so that we can leave here and be instructed and encouraged and, Lord, have a, a, a new outlook on how badly we're needed in this matter of helping others get back in the race. And we pray it in your precious name, Lord, and for your sake. Amen. All right. Well, hey, you know what? I think all of us would agree <laughs> that it's extremely common for people to make New Year's resolutions, right? We all make New Year's resolutions, but it's so common for them to go by the wayside. You know, one week, two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, and those, those things have disappeared. We had a list, and that's gone in the, in the file cabinet, the round one on the floor. Anyway, so you know what? Uh, a study by a group called Foursquare and Swarm shows that February 4th, February 4th, there we go. Okay, oh, that last one, we lost the slide there. Okay, so February 4th is the typical date um, that 37 days after New Year's that people are likely to give up. Now, based on the data from the online grocer Fresh Direct, okay, they're using their data, and the first one's already up there, by February 4th, people like that had quit, tried to quit drinking because they were drinking too much. Liquor and wine consumption picks up by 40% in the first two weeks of February, while juice cleanses <laughs> are down 25%. Oh, those delicious prune juice uh, cleanses, yes. And then shoppers were also, they bought 15% more ice cream and desserts. And are we shocked? 35% more pizza. Pizza, pizza. And then February 4th also marked an uptick in visits. Oh, going the wrong direction. Upticks in visits to fast food uh, places. They're going up. And unfortunately, to the gym, not so good. They're going down. February 4th, 37 days. We only made it 37 days. So you know what? This is just talking about the human condition. Okay, this is just the human condition. You know what? And how much we need each other, you know, how much we need each other. You know, like I've said many times, you know, it's like your pastor. What's a pastor for? Many things, but one thing is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. <laughs> so, so, you know what, I just, I just have to do that. Why? Because we're human. You know what, if I didn't yell and scream and, and taunt and shame and all those wonderful things I do, Sissy loved my picture. I sent you right about, the, about the, all the hands coming in on that poor lady. <laughs> anyway, all right, humans. Humans are pretty good at starting, but not so good at finishing. Okay, and the Galatian Christians were in this boat as well. And so we're going to go verse by verse through our text now. We'll give you three main points, and then we'll be done. And here's that verse we looked at too, but I want to go a little bit deeper because this is so interesting. Did you know that in the space of 7, 8, 9, and 10, there's four verses, and there's three English words there 
And they're all different, but in Greek, they're basically the same words. But the English translators translated them three different ways, and I'm going to show you that in just a second. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying? And I underlined, I, in my notes, I have it underlined, obeying the truth. There's that word. Okay? And sometimes in our New Testament, it's translated obey, but sometimes it has the nuance of persuasion. And here's kind of a paraphrase of what Paul's saying here to the Galatians. Who hindered you? Who cut in front? Hindered doesn't mean just to hold back somebody back. It means like cutting them off in a race. Cutting. It's actually like a word, like a surgeon cutting. Okay. Who cut in front of you and stopped you from, notice, being persuaded by the truth? See, Paul pers had persuaded them early on. Here is salvation through Jesus. Here is discipleship, following Jesus. Okay? And they were persuaded. Man, they said, we're, we're tracking with you, Paul. We believe you. We got it. But guess what? No longer are they persuaded the truth. Now they're being persuaded by lies. And that brings us to the next verse here, verse 8. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying? Who hindered you from being persuaded by the truth? This persuasion, notice, see that's the same word almost. This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. So obeying and, that, obeying and persuasion come from the same Greek root. This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. Not, Jesus didn't persuade you to do that. He didn't persuade you to think about like that, like these false teachers are saying, to live under the Old Testament laws. In the Old Testament law, this persuasion that's based on lies does not come from him who calls you. And then he says this, a little leaven, okay, okay, yeast, a little yeast leavens the whole lump. Okay, you take dough, and you only need a little bit, and that will spread through it, and it will cause that dough to rise, okay? You know, they didn't put yeast in on the, on the uh, Passover bread, okay? It was unleavened bread, okay? They had a purpose for it, basically because yeast pictured in some cases, evil and sin. And of course, that would be here. That teaching from those teachers, all you need is a little bit of that bad teaching and it can throw you for a bad loop. Okay, I'll give you for instance. Well, you know what? I just don't believe that eternal life is absolutely free. Just one thing. Okay, just one thing. Whoa. Okay, think about that, everybody. Okay, that's... That gets in, it spreads all over the place in the church or in family. That's bad. Okay, point number one here. Paul's giving them a caution. That didn't come from Jesus. That came from the false teachers. Caution, okay. Oh, there we go. Three's a charm. Caution, unbiblical teaching like legalism can start off small but eventually ruin an entire church. Okay? You could have a small stick of dynamite and it could blow up and cause a lot of damage. All right, And so Paul's giving caution here to God's people. He's trying to say, hey, you all need to get back in the race. I'm cautioning you. I'm telling you. I'm warning you. That didn't come from Jesus. All right, uh, It was the false teachers who cut, on, cut in on them as they ran a good race and persuaded them to turn from grace to legalism. It wasn't Jesus. These false teachers hurt the entire church. Okay, so listen carefully, everybody. Let's apply this, okay? We need to do all we can to help people messed up with false teaching, okay? We need to have enough knowledge to be able to guide them and say, you know what? Um, I'm not really sure that what you believe is in tune with God's Word. Do you mind if I help you out there and share something? Okay, you get the idea. We got to do that and help people in all the different ways. It might be false teaching. It might just be bad thinking. It might be they just started thinking badly. They might be bitter. They might be angry. They might be uh, jealous, whatever it is. And they're, they're off, you know, they're, they've been knocked out of the race. Their focus isn't on Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Their focus is on me, myself, and I, all my problems and their bitterness. Or their focus is on another person, how they want to get revenge or something. Oh, but pastor, that doesn't happen to save people. That only happens to lost people. <laughs> Survey said. Yeah. So, that's not all. 
You and I, as God's people, need to protect the church from bad teaching ever getting in. The leaders, the pastor are trying, but you know what? You're out there in, you're out there in, the, uh, in the war, all right? And you may hear things before I hear them, and you need to take a stand. Don't let bad teaching, false teaching come in. And you know, over the years, I've always said to the elders and to God's people, I've said, hey, listen, you know what? If something I say in a, a Bible study, a lesson, uh, is off kilter, come and talk to me. And tell me why. Why do you think that's the case? And you know what? If I am, I'll, I'm going to take that to heart. But I'm going to do my best not to do that. I'm going to do my best to stick with God's word, okay? We can't let bad teaching ever get a foot in the door in our church. And moms and dads, listen, can't let it happen with your children. You know, I've seen so many times mom and dads don't have enough they don't have enough um, care and concern with their younger children. And then time goes slip sliding away like the old song says. And then all of a sudden their children are 11, 12, 13, and they start thinking, oh, you know what? I just thought of something. You know what? I need to start making sure. You know what? In our world today, it's too late. <laughs> it's too late. Man, you've got to be filling them with God's word, the things of God. You know, like when Lauren's here today, and she'll testify this, when Lauren and Nicole were little, man, I look forward to this big book Kelly bought me, and I would take them and get them on the couch and sit one either side of me, and night by night we would read that book together, and we would, and then at the end it had questions, and it had cool stories that I could tell them. And then after we got done, I'd say, okay, let's get down on our knees. And so we'd get down next to the couch, and we would, we would pray. We would pray together. And then at night, um, um, you know, Marilyn, who sits down here, she, she, her granddaughter made this little puppet. It was like you took a, a snow cone thing that's made out of cardboard, like an upside-down snow cone, and it had a stick coming through there, and, and it would pop its head out from the bottom of the snow cone, and I can turn the head, and my daughters thought that thing was real. We'd be in bed. They would be getting ready for bed, and I'd get out, and I'd take that out and say, and Tiffany was Marilyn's granddaughter, so I called her Tiffany, right, Lauren? And I'd pop that head up, hello, and I'd turn the head, and she'd be looking, you know, at Nicole and Lauren, and they thought that that thing was talking to them. But you know what? I would just tell them about Jesus and tell them neat things because I wanted them to go to bed that way. During the day, you know what? See, there weren't iPads and stuff. I mean, at the end, computers started to come into play, but, but there weren't things like iPhones and stuff like that early on. And so, you know, one thing that Kelly and I did so much of, we bought, man, these 12 Christian Hero uh, videos. They were on VHS back then. But 12 Christian Hero videos of America's history. And it had a Christian slant on all 12 videos. Then we did 12 videos of the New Testament. And you know what? I used to just play those over and over and over. And in fact, Lauren cannot quit thinking about them to this day. They're in her brain. <laughs> she says, Dad, help me. I keep thinking of No, anyway. But, but anyway, I just did that so much. Why? Because I knew when, boom, when they went out of the nest when they were 18 and Lauren and Nicole went off to, uh, off to Baylor. And, you know, I, I think both of them came back from Baylor in their life. Dad, <laughs> you won't believe. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, it's not good to shelter those kids. Hey, I'd rather have them sheltered and filled with God and his word and then go out there than to have nothing of God inside of them and then to go out off to college and then just hear everything and they get, they come back and say, you know, it's Thanksgiving, it's Thanksgiving, and they come back for Thanksgiving, and they say, oh, Mom, Dad, you know, I know I've gone to church my whole life, but I don't believe in God anymore. It takes them two months to get destroyed. And you know what? I've seen it, I've seen it, I've seen it, and it's heartbreaking. So we've got to protect our church. We've got to protect our children, grandchildren, every way we can. All the people are, you know what, everybody? You just need to be a, a living fire hydrant of help to others. You say, yeah, but I've got trouble. I know, but guess what? As you start reaching out to others, man, your problems go down and God's grace goes up and God uses you and it's amazing what God will do. 
All that's required, it's been said, for evil to prosper is for good people to do nothing. All right, that's number one, okay? Now, let's go to verse 10. Paul turns from cautiously informing God's people. He's telling them, hey, listen, this didn't come from Jesus. He goes from informing them and cautioning them to encouraging them. He says, I have confidence in you. By the way, that's that same word. <laughs> I'm persuaded of you. I'm persuaded about you. I'm convinced about you. Okay? He says, I have confidence in verse 10. Let's see. Let me put that up here. There it is. There's that third time that same Greek word or a cognate is used. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, Galatians, that you will have no other mind. In other words, that you'll agree with me about grace. But, contrast, he who troubles you, singular, the ringleader, the head false teacher, he who troubles you shall bear his judgment. He's going to pay a price, whoever he is. Divine judgment's coming regardless of this teacher's prominence and his esteem. Okay, number one was caution. Number two is confidence. He's trying to send encouragement to the Galatians. And this is what, what he means here. Struggling believers need to know that they can get back in the race. Need to know that. Don't ever think that God's given up on you. I don't care if you've been out one minute, one day, one week, one month, one year, one decade. Listen, God wants his sheep to return to him. And guess what? Uh, he told Israel they were so evil. Israel, his chosen people in the Old Testament. And he tells them, uh, return to me and I will abundantly pardon you. I'll abundantly pardon you. I'm full of grace. He says, he says, um, to Israel, though your sins are like scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they be like crimson, they will be like wool. He says, I'll wash it away. That's, that's my job. That's my uh, desire. That's what I want to do. I know humans fail. But listen, I'll take you back. I'll love you again. I'll hug you. Yes, you've played the harlot. That's what he said to Israel. You've played the harlot. You've gone off to a whore. The idols, false teachers, idols. And false gods. And he says, I will abundantly pardon you. You know, one time I was at a, Kelly and I went to a funeral viewing of one of our members, uh, was a brother of one of our members up in Bonham. I've told you this story before. And, you know, I had never been up there and it's pretty quite a good ways away from Richardson. And so got to the funeral home, was fellowshipping and, and encouraging and everything. And then it was so late. So it was a long, long day. It was like 9 o'clock at night, and then I still had the, the drive back to Dallas, hour, hour and a half, whatever that was. And so I was so tired, I came out of the, um, <clears throat> out of the funeral home, and I turned left onto Highway 77 to get back to Dallas. Unfortunately, I was driving for a half an hour, and I saw this sign on the side of the road. Okay? <laughs> I knew that Shreveport wasn't near Dallas. And I'm like, uh-oh. And so the first exit that I could find, I exited, whoop, went back over and came back and got, uh, and got my car pointed in the right direction, all right? And, you know, that is like a child of God going in the wrong direction, Okay. But God has got an amazing exit ramp for you and I if we've gotten our spiritual car turned around. He's got the great exit ramp of repentance, okay? We can turn, <laughs> do a 180, and be going in the right direction for God by repentance, okay? You know, repentance is, is that turnaround, okay? It's coming back to God getting his forgiveness, getting reassured of his love. Like Paul had confidence in the Galatians, God has confidence in us. He loves us and he wants us to go forward running in the right direction. This past week, Kelly sent me a great quote from Barbara Rainey. You remember uh, 
his, her husband's Dennis, yeah, Dennis and Barbara Rainey and The Weekend to Remember and all the things on marriage they wrote. But she, Kelly sent me this quote, this picture off of Instagram or something like that. And, whoops, uh, did I jump past something? Oh, there it is. Okay. God himself, this is what she sent me. God himself has never washed his hands of us saying, I quit, I give up, and we shouldn't quit on helping others either. We are to be like God. Be holy, for I am holy. Be like me. Be like me. All right? Now, apparently, and this is that next slide I accidentally went to, there were people, the false teachers, who were telling the Galatians that Paul was preaching that physical, you know, Paul was gone. And these teachers, well, this is what Paul's been teaching them, or been, this is what Paul's been teaching, okay? Uh, that physical circumcision was God's path for New Testament believers. And Paul says, no way, verse 11, no way. I, brethren, <laughs> if I still preach circumcision like I did before I was a Christian, that's all I did. I went around and preached the law, the law, the law, the law. If I still do what I did before I met Jesus, then why do I still suffer persecution? Why am I so hated? If I'm preaching what everybody else is preaching, then why is everybody calling me a heretic? Why is everybody hating me? Paul says if that was the case, the offense that people have to the cross of Jesus, it ceased. I shouldn't be getting hammered for telling people about that they need Jesus, that they need his work on the cross. I should be getting, I, I get hammered for that. That should have ceased if I was teaching like they're teaching, the false teachers that are teaching you, Galatians. Paul was arguing if I preached the law rather than grace, I wouldn't be offending anyone. The fact that I'm being persecuted is a sign that I preach the cross of Christ and grace and not the law. Not for eternal life and not for Christian living, okay? As a rule for Christian living, okay? We can benefit from the things Moses wrote in the Mosaic Covenant, but we're not to use it as a, a rule for Christian living. We're not under the law. We're under grace. In 2 Corinthians, it's called the ministration of death. <laughs> you want a great Christian life? Then live by the ministry of death. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, you're going to croak spiritually if you do that. You put yourself under the law. Okay, now, this crazy verse. This is almost like an Old Testament. It's kind of a form of an Old Testament, what they call... Um, uh, oh, I just lost the, uh, the, the word for this. Uh, but once I read this, you'll know where I was going. Oh, verse 12 disappeared. Okay, well, I'll just have to quote it to you then. <laughs> Robert, we're having slides disappear. Okay, um, Paul says in verse 12, I could wish, and he's talking about the false teachers, and he says, I could wish that those who trouble you would cut themselves off. Okay, now, <laughs> that's a polite way that the Bible translators put it in there, but they were just saying that Paul was preaching that Gentiles should get circumcised. And Paul says, no, I think that they should get circumcised and the knife should slip. Whoop! Castration. It's, uh, Ray, what, what is the term I'm thinking of, the, the uh, kind of psalms where they would say, bash their heads against the rocks? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, the imprecatory psalms. I don't know why that went out of my brain. The imprecations in the Old Testament. You read stuff in the Old Testament where we're saying, you know, there's just this fiery speech like that, and that imprecation is, is people that are all worked up, just like humans get worked up over things. Paul's all worked up. And what's coming out of him is not literal. You know, man, I wish their children were bashed against the rocks. That's their feelings inside. That's how they're feeling on the inside. They're just like, they're so upset. You know, think about it. If, if something just tragic happened to you or one of your children or a spouse and, and a criminal did something, you know, you wouldn't be, you know, like the church lady. Now, that's just fine. That's no problem. Okay. 
that's not going to happen, okay? You're going to be so filled with anger and just, just going off the charts and you just want to, I just want to strangle that person. Now, you're not saying it literally, though we can get awful close sometimes, but I'm just saying you feel these things and Paul's saying, I wish that they would emasculate themselves. I wish they would, ca- I wish those false teachers would castrate themselves. He's not talking literally. He's so worked up about how he hates what they're teaching them that he's saying, you know, in a, in a, um, in a figurative sense, He's just saying, you know what, I wish that spiritually they would neuter themselves spiritually so they wouldn't be able to have, to procreate, as it were, spiritual uh, followers. Because they keep talking and they keep talking and they keep sharing falsehoods and boom, 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 boom. And their crowd grows. You know, Jim Jones got... Almost 800 people, I believe, to drink the Kool-Aid in South America back in 1978, the year I graduated from high school. 800 people to go down with him to South America. And then David Koresh. These false teachers, you know, they, and Paul's saying, I wish that they couldn't reproduce anymore. You get the idea. So Paul's helping the Galatians to see what they had come to believe is terrible, something that the church needs to immediately. Now Paul gives them another reason. That's the negative. He gives them a positive reason. Watch this. Look at verse 13 up here. You brethren, here's another reason to get back in the race. You brethren have been called to liberty. Oh, and I don't have the rest of the verse. It's on the next slide. Okay, let's stop right there. God never intended his people to live in bondage to the Old Testament law. You have been called to liberty. You're not in bondage a slave to like a long, a kind of long list Christianity. I'm going to make a list and all I need to do is read this list every day and memorize it and I'll be a great Christian. No, you won't. No, you won't. That's not the way God says that you become a great Christian. God says you become a great Christian by taking his word and regularly letting it sink in. Jesus said, let these things sink deep down into your ears. (laughs) And when you let those things sink in, day after day, week after week, the Bible says you'll see Christ's image in God's Word and you will be, listen to this, supernaturally transformed into the likeness of Jesus, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, 2 Corinthians 3.18. Holiness, sanctification is a miracle. It's not... It's, it's, it's not done by making up a list of things that are even good to live by. No, you can't do it apart from God's Word. You can't do it apart from His Spirit. Jesus said, if you don't stay close to me without me, you can do nothing. <laughs> Anything that's of value, you can't do it. So he first says, brethren, you've been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity to the flesh. For the flesh. Don't give in to what to the impulses of your body. Don't do that. Because that'll get you in a heap of trouble. See, you got a new man or a new woman when you got saved living in an old body. When when I got saved when I was almost nineteen, I brought the same body into the Christian life that I had a day before I was saved. And that body likes to go this way. And Jesus wants to go this way. And so don't use your liberty in Jesus. Don't use the fact that you're free and that you'll never never go to hell for anything you do. Don't say, well, hey, I'm just going to sin it up. Man, I'm going to heaven anyway. I might as well just do whatever I want to do. Paul says, no, no, no. That's not God's will for you. Don't use your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. What are we to do? What are we to do? Look, but through love, serve one another. Ah, okay. What is our freedom for? Our freedom in Christ is so that we can love and serve one another. You know, the Christian life isn't difficult. It's just becoming like Jesus. Well, let me just... (laughs) Survey. I'm I'm just saying that God boils it down here for us. And he makes it rather simple. Now, 
I realize that there's a lot of there's a lot of things that are very difficult and but what I'm saying here is this everybody understanding that God's will for us is not to give in to our sinful passions but to love each other and to serve each other I mean we can look at one another and say you know that's doable I'm not going to be perfect in fact I'm going to fail all along the way but you know what I can keep keep going in this direction with God's grace you get the idea and I love what Paul says in verse 14 all the law is fulfilled in one word okay in this one statement this one word Okay, not literally one word, just one statement. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. An Old Testament quotation. Okay, all the law is fulfilled in that one word. That's amazing. Okay, so number one, we talked about the caution Paul was given. Number two, we talked about the confidence Paul had in the Galatians. And finally, number three, okay, compassion. Compassion. Focus on serving others lovingly rather than looking down on others legalistically. (laughs) Okay, that's so easy to do, is to look down on other people. You don't like something they're saying, you don't like something they're they're doing, and so you just look up. You know, the person's been saved for six months. Well, I can't believe that they would say that. I can't believe that they would do... Well, you know, hey, listen, give people slack. You know, God cut you slack for 40 years. Why do we have to go around looking down on people because they did this, they said that, or whatever, and just hammering people? Hey, we're here to love one another and serve one another, not to hammer people, all right? You know, uh, in fact, Paul says there's a flip coin, or a flip side to the coin, sorry about that which is another way that Christians can treat each other. You could serve in love or look at verse... Is somebody pushing a button back there, Robert? I am? I'm not... Okay, okay, I'm doing it. (laughs) That's bad. Okay. If you bite and devour one another, this is the flip side of the coin. If you, you Galatians, you save people, if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Wow! We can chew each other up. We can be consumed by each other. Yep, in the church, in our homes. Yes, it, it happens, and it's just awful, okay? This world we live in is full of lonely, hurting people that feel unloved and rejected, and we have an opportunity to let them know we care in our places of work, at home, in our church. We've got all kinds of opportunities. So that's the 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 thrust, the crux of what Paul's trying to get across to God's people. You know what? I want you in the race. God wants you in the race. He wants you running with your eyes on Jesus, serving one another in love, and then so that when you get to the end of your life, you can finish well. You know, the Bible says we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It isn't going to determine whether we end up in heaven or hell, because that's already determined the moment you believe. The moment a person says yes to the free gift of eternal life, to God's promise in Christ, the moment they say yes and and are persuaded by that promise God makes that he'll give you eternal life absolutely free, once they're persuaded, that's a done deal. Well, then you say, well, what's the judgment seat of Christ all about? God's going to look at our lives because he's going to say, you know what, I want to reward people who have served me especially well like people who finish the race well. People who run the race, they fall down, they get up, they run, they fall down, they get up, they run, they keep going. They're going steady to the end. Jesus said, that's what the judgment seat of Christ. He's going to look at our lives, and, you know, the bad in our lives, unfortunately, can't be rewarded. The good in our lives will be rewarded. But, you know, we're going to have to give an account. We're going to have to give an account to Jesus. Not... So we can keep, we can continue the, on into heaven. No, we're, we're going to go there either way, whether we fail him or whether we glorify him. But I'm just saying that that's a great motivation for you and I to go, keep going strong. You know, listen, you know, I can't believe June 20th, it's going to be my 43rd year since I got saved. And you know, it just doesn't seem that long to me. And you know, I've been running for 43 years. 
keeping my eyes on Jesus, staying on my knees, staying in the Word. And I just keep running. And you know what, everybody? Now <laughs> I'm starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Now I'm starting to see the finish line a little bit. And you know what? I'm even more motivated that, man, I'm going to be seeing Jesus. And of course, I wake up and try every day to say, Jesus, I may see you today. <laughs> so, and it's great, Lord. I can't wait. But I want to keep, I want to keep running. Notice I quit already. I had a, I had a uh, New Year's resolution to keep running, you know, and I can't keep running. Okay. So, all right, finally, let's have a final story, and it's an Olympic story. Okay, Derek Redman, Derek Redman, amazing runner. Okay, this isn't the marathon. This is the four by 100. What is that? Four runners, and they're put in different positions around the track. They each have to run 100 yards. So basically, these guys are so fast, they can run the length of a football field, in either nine or ten seconds, roughly in that area. I don't know. Does anybody know if anybody's broken the nine-second mark yet? I don't think they have. So, but nine seconds to go 100 yards, that is fast. Well, they're, they're running full bore, and they have to pass a baton to each other. You know that? Four runners. The guy that's, at the start, that's starting, he runs 100 yards, and he puts it in the next guy's hand. He's got to run 100 yards as fast as he can. Well, Derek Redman for America, or I'm sorry, Great Britain, Great Britain, he was in the number four guy. He was the last guy to take the baton and run across the finish line. Think about that. That race is over in like 40 seconds or something, probably even less maybe. I don't know. They're passing the baton, so that might slow him, so it might be 45 seconds. But anyway, it's fast, less than a minute. And so they're going full bore, and Derek Redmond for England was the last guy. And man, they were doing great in this race, but guess what? He got the baton, he took off and was going around that bend, and his Achilles tendon, the one on the back of your heel, blew. And the next thing, he was on the ground, writhing in pain. Let's see, I've got it here. He's there and he's just utterly in pain because he has, you know, that thing's just severed there. And you can imagine, I mean, it's just got to be the worst. And then he began to crawl. You could hear a pin drop in the stadium because the other runners were, were done. Like the earlier story, they were done a long time before. And so here he is. He starts crawling toward the finish line. And he's just in agony. He's in agony. There's all kinds of pictures on the internet. And in the midst of this unfolding drama, a man comes out of the stands. This is in Barcelona, 1992. A man comes out of the stands and lifted Derek Redman to his feet. And he's helping him. He's screaming in agony, but he wants to finish for his country. And he's helping him down the track. The judge comes and he says, Sir, you need to leave the track right now. You need to leave this track. And this man that came out of the stand says, uh, waves his hands and he says, This is my boy. This is my boy. And he and his dad walk down the track together and cross the finish line. And of course, you know what happens. The crowd comes unglued. But I love the, that the father, <laughs> think about that. The father, he comes out of the stands. And if we think about God, about God the Father, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, okay? Um, I think about that. He got more applause, Derek Redmond, than the runners who never fell. The crowd just was enormous. The runners who never fell didn't need help from anyone in the stands. They ran the race without finishing. But what about all the people around us that are failing, that are faltering? You know what? Listen, a tiny group of people in any church can't do everything like in the, even in the matter of helping others, okay? 
We can make phone calls and do different things and try to encourage, but you know what? It takes all of God's people. Man, listen, if you just got a list, maybe ladies, if you got a list of five other ladies and maybe several of them aren't, maybe they've fallen out of the race and you started calling and encouraging. So the question I have for you this morning is this is symbolizing God the Father reaching down to us when we're in need. Will you be like God the Father to those around you that have fallen, or like Jesus? You say it anyway. People that are struggling to finish the race, will you leave, being, will you leave behind being a spectator and just watching everything? Come out of the stands and lift up those who are hurting. God called you and I not only to freedom, but he's called us to liberate others. He's made us free. We need to help others find that freedom. Maybe they're not even saved. They need to be saved. Maybe they're saved, but they're laying on the track and they're writhing in pain. Something's happened to them. They've been bruised and beaten by life, by sin, or maybe even by those around them. So my question as I close right now before prayer is this. Will you, will you help other people get back in the race? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, what a marvelous word this is to us, Lord. It just paints a beautiful picture of, Lord, how we are to relate to others. Serve one another in love. Serve one another in love. And Father, how we need all, all of us to do all we can. We can't do everything. But all of us can do something, Lord. And one day we'll stand before you, Lord, and we'll give an account. God, I pray for all of us, Lord. I ask that your hand would rest on all of us to be those kind of people. Today, Lord, I just ask that you'll bless your precious sheep, Lord. You love them so much. And I pray that you'll help them in this race. Give them strength. Give them durability. Give them help. Give them grace, Lord. Help them down the road. If they fall, the just person falls seven times, gets back up. God, help them. Help them to focus on you. Run the race with endurance, looking unto Jesus. And we pray these things in your precious name and for your sake, Father. Amen. All right, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful, wonderful Mother's Day and week. By the way, moms, right out in the hallway, we've got the little uh, picture area there. Uh, Brother Robert's going to be there to take pictures. You could also pull your iPhones out and get, the, you get your instant picture. But, um, but go over there, get your family together and get a picture. Or if, if they're not here, have somebody take your picture and then you could send it to your children and grandchildren. But take advantage of that, all right? Okay, you're dismissed. Enjoy each other's fellowship, everyone. Have a great, great week. Thanks.